Hello, my name is Matt Reardon, and thanks for watching this Wednesday evening, June 7th, West Weather Update brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Uh, to start, I thought we'd look at something a little bit different here. This is a satellite loop of Super Typhoon Millar. Now, this occurred or really reached kind of peak strength about two weeks ago, kind of that last week of May in the far western Pacific. You're looking at a satellite loop really during kind of this peak strength of the Super Typhoon, extremely powerful storm, really impressive satellite imagery from this. Play a few different loops here. You can see this very clear eye, uh, even from satellite all the way up from space. This is kind of a clue to us as meteorologists that this is a very powerful system. Uh, it was strong even for a very uh, strong storm. What I mean by that is wind speeds, uh, one minute sustained up at 185 miles an hour, uh, just extreme uh, wind speeds there. Uh, lowest pressure, uh, minimum pressure recording from the storm, I believe, was 897 millibars. Just to kind of give you a comparison, Hurricane Katrina, as powerful it was in the Gulf of Mexico uh, for the U.S., only 175 miles an hour maximum sustained winds. I say only, uh, still an extremely powerful storm, but minimum pressure readings from Katrina just above 900. I believe that not 902, maybe 903 millibars. So this storm even more powerful than Hurricane Katrina. Now, fortunately, a difference here is this didn't make landfall at that peak intensity. Uh, it weakened quite a bit as it moved toward the west, toward some of the larger land masses in the western Pacific. Ended up kind of glancing past. Uh, Taiwan ended up impacting parts of Japan with heavy rainfall, uh, but fortunately most folks avoided a big damaging landfall out of this, except for maybe Guam, some of these other islands here in the western uh, Pacific. Now I'm mentioning this, this is all the way out in the western Pacific, miles, thousands of miles in fact away uh, from North America, but I mention it because it has effects on our weather here, uh, all the way over here in the western region of the United States. And I'll kind of paint that picture here. This is looking at jet stream level winds. It's kind of the contours here on this map, and it's also highlighting low pressure systems at the surface. Now this is a GFS forecast all the way back from June 1st, and I'm showing it about a week ago because I'm trying to capture the end of the life cycle of that super typhoon Malar. And kind of conveniently it's painting all those low pressure systems, and certainly even a weakening super typhoon is going to show up as one of these low pressure systems. And here that is just east of Taiwan, kind of right over Okinawa here is a 975 millibar low here, still a rather deep low in terms of, you know, what typ we typically see maybe in North America. You'll watch it quickly kind of get yanked up into the jet stream here over the North Pacific, and I want you to notice the effect it has on this Pacific jet stream here, which is rather kind of wobbly uh, and disjointed here at the beginning of the forecast period. But as that super typhoon recurves up into the North Pacific, you'll notice we have a marked strengthening in that jet stream here from Japan all the way out here into the North Pacific, south of the Aleutians in Alaska. Hurricanes, tropical storms, super typhoons, whatever you want to call them, release a tremendous amount of heat into the atmosphere. And these particularly strong storms are going to release even more of that heat content into the atmosphere, which helps to fuel and strengthen the gradients that promote and strengthen the jet stream. And we've talked you know, ad nauseum about how these jet stream winds, the shape and the strength of them, can affect our weather here in the western part of the United States. And certainly anything that's going to affect the shape, the positioning, the strength of that Pacific jet stream, kind of upstream from where our weather is influenced, is gonna have an impact here in the United States. And if we play this forecast forward, kind of all the way up to the current day, you'll notice that increased strength of the Pacific jet stream is inching its way east across the Pacific to the point where if I kind of bring this back valid as a Wednesday evening here, You'll notice the strongest piece of this jet stream kind of north of Hawaii here, but it's splitting into two components. It's splitting into this northern component, this ridging over Canada, and it's splitting into the southern component. This is the subtropical jet stream that we've been talking about uh, for it feels like a number of weeks here coming out of the subtropics of the Pacific. And it's really just kind of entrenching and strengthening this consistent pattern we've seen of cooler, more inclement weather, kind of the central and southern part of the western region, and the warmer weather, the upper level ridging promoting heat and drier weather in the Pacific Northwest and some heat waves associated with that as well. So big plume, big strengthening of the jet stream uh, in the Pacific, kind of entrenching this weather we've already seen, but a connection between what's going on, activity, convection, all the way in the Western Pacific, all the way across the largest ocean here on Earth, impacting and entrenching some of the weather that we've seen here uh, over the United States. Now, if we look at current sea surface temperatures, we just talked about that subtropical jet stream. We've really kind of connected that increased strength of the subtropical jet stream to what is a developing El Nino in the Eastern Pacific. And what we mean by El Nino, a term we use a lot, is just warmer than average ocean water in the central tropical Pacific. 
and we tend to measure the central tropical Pacific with a box. We call this uh, El Nino 3.4. There's a number of different ways you could measure kind of these different El Nino regions, but it kind of goes back to the name. If we think El Nino, what, where did that name come from? Well, it actually came from South American fishermen in the 20th century that noticed as the waters warmed off the west coast of uh, really Peru, that their catch, their, the fish that was coming in their nets shrank. And we know that nutrient-dense water in the ocean tends to get upwelled as cooler water from deeper in the ocean. It's colder than average, and that tends to contain more fish. So as you kind of warm up the ocean temperatures, there's less fish in that less nutrient-dense water. The fishermen notice this very quickly, this kind of coincidence. And they called it El Nino because it tended to occur in late December around these kind of Christmas months, this Christmas season, where El Nino being the child, you know, the birth of Christ, the Christ child. So they called it El Nino, and now we call the kind of cold phase of this, the opposite pattern, La Nina, which is kind of the, the opposite of that. So it really developed as this kind of coincidence over here in the Eastern Pacific. And it just so happens that El Nino, when it develops, tends to show up first here off the coast of Peru. And if we really look at the Central Pacific, where are the waters most anomalously warm? It's kind of right there in that area just off the west coast of South America near Peru. And it's only recently begun to stretch now across the central tropical Pacific where we really define kind of the modern day official El Nino term. And I'll show you those different regions here. We have that kind of first region, El Nino 1 and 2, over here just off the coast of Peru. That's one area where we start to kind of track the warm waters here. But that kind of official region here is what we call El Nino 3.4, right here in the central tropical Pacific south of Hawaii, kind of almost the midpoint between South America in Indonesia. Now, we show this map a lot. I've shown this. This is, if we just read the top of the map, the title here, Sea Surface Temperature Anomalies. So these kind of colors here are relative to average, and that's important to note here. If we look at just the absolute temperature, this is how you know, the water would feel if you actually jumped into it, not just relative to average, but kind of absolute temperature. We can see that here in the Eastern Pacific, the water's actually, uh, at least relative to the rest of the tropical Pacific Ocean, rather cool. If anything, it's warmer over here in the Western Pacific. Now, what you're seeing here is really just kind of a feature of these global circulations that are almost ever present in our atmosphere. We have the trade winds. Those blow from the Northeast toward the Southwest. They blow this way in the Atlantic as well. We call them the trade winds because they helped facilitate trade uh, from Europe toward the Americas, uh, you know, centuries ago. But those same trade winds blow from the Northeast toward the Southwest in the Northern Hemisphere in the Pacific, and they blow from the Southeast toward the Northwest and the Southern Hemisphere. And that helps to push water across the Pacific Ocean from the east to the west and helps to upwell some of this cold water here in the Eastern Pacific. Now that upwelling is what helps to promote these bountiful fishing grounds here off the west coast of South America. And now while it's absolutely kind of cooler relative to the rest of the Pacific, it's actually quite a bit warmer uh, than even normal here when we talk about relative to average or relative to that kind of historical norm. And that's enough to kind of hint to us that this El Nino is developing. Now, as this kind of gyre in the atmosphere, it also has kind of a reflection in the oceans. And so you get what we call these kind of oceanic gyres that spin counter, or I should say clockwise like this in the Northern Hemisphere. And they help to promote things like the uh, Kuroshio Current uh, in Japan, or what we just call the Japan Current, uh, the North Atlantic uh, Current here off the Eastern Seaboard. You can see some of these warm waters being pushed up the East Coast here. Uh, and then even all the way, you know, you have the East Australian Current as this flows counterclockwise now uh, in the Southern Hemisphere and helps to, on the kind of back side of this or the east side of this, push some of this cold water uh, up the coast, uh, or I could say down the coast if we flip things around here in South America. So all these things are kind of connected. I wanted to show this map because we often just show this as a anomaly, but really there's kind of absolute temperatures that uh, can be important here as well. In fact, some of the warmer waters here in the Western Northern uh, Pacific help to promote some of those very strong storms that we were just talking about, Super Typhoon Moir, just one example. Now, if I take this back to kind of the present day, I'll make this valid as a Wednesday evening. Here's the jet stream again, this forecast from the ECMWF. There is that strong jet stream north of Hawaii splitting into the southern component, that subtropical component, helping fueled by El Nino, uh, splitting to the north and upper level ridging. This has helped to promote the warmth uh, kind of to the northern half of the western region, uh, the subtropical jet stream helping to promote the precip in the interior, some of the precip and storms getting in now to the elevations of California, particularly the Sierra Nevadas, but keeping this kind of southern western region cooler than average as a result of the subtropical jet stream pushing in uh, to the area. Now, if I take this forecast out, you'll notice that 
jet stream still splitting off the west coast of the United States. This is all the way out to Saturday, uh, June 10th now. We still see some of this anomalous ridging here over Canada, likely to keep the warmth lingering in parts of Washington, Idaho, and Montana. We have this kind of southern extension of the jet stream here, what we call the subtropical jet stream, spinning up into California now. If I play this out into Sunday, all the way into Monday, you'll notice we now have what I'd really call kind of a bona fide upper level trough here spinning really kind of right over California. That's going to certainly keep kind of that uh, cloudy shower storm weather lingering around the central western United States. Now, are we going to get showers and storms all the way into the central valley? I think that's possible, particularly Sunday and Monday. Not expecting widespread rainfall out of a system like this, but certainly can't rule out you know, a shower or thunderstorm either initiating off the mountains in the Sierra Nevada or even some of the coastal mountains and kind of getting into maybe the Salinas uh, Valley, certainly could get into the Central Valley, uh, either the San Joaquin or the North Valley. I think it a little bit more likely that if we do get rainfall or storms into the Central Valley, it will be the central or northern portion of the valley. Uh, but I can't rule out something coming, you know, even through Hanford or Fresno next week. It's kind of a rogue shower or thunderstorm. Temperatures though a bit more predictable. They'll be cooler in California, uh, parts of Nevada, uh, likely even all the way into Utah. And then as this is kind of this portion of the jet stream is splitting uh, toward the north and this upper level ridging, we're going to keep that kind of entrenched pattern of warmer weather up toward the north, toward the Pacific Northwest, going at least out to Monday. Now this is June 12th. If I take this forecast kind of beyond that into next week, not a huge change until we get all the way out into kind of the 14th and 15th. We see this upper level low kind of now spinning and exiting off California here, but we still see this kind of strong uh, subtropical component in the jet stream. Jet stream further toward the north, what we call the kind of the polar piece of the jet stream, still in this kind of quasi ridging, pushing over the Pacific Northwest. In fact, we almost kind of have a blocked pattern of the jet stream kind of folding back in on itself. We have a high in the upper levels, uh, kind of an upper level ridge here over an upper level trough looks kind of like a block, hinting that this might not be going anywhere anytime soon, which is just what we've seen over the last few weeks, not a huge change in that entrenched pattern. If we just look at the next 10 days of temperature anomalies, based on the conversation we just talked about, this is from the ensembles from the ECMWF, not a huge shocker to see that kind of persistent pattern, cooler over California, cooler over Nevada, even extending into Utah, parts of Arizona, excuse me, even through the lower Colorado River Valley, further toward the north, the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, parts of Montana, warmer than average. And I think we continue with that drier spell in the Pacific Northwest in the Willamette Valley as a result of that. Precipitation picture over that same time period, 10 day forecast, precip anomalies, kind of the heaviest precipitation. We talked about that upper level low spinning into this area on Sunday and Monday, expecting precipitation to fall, particularly along the Sierra Nevadas where thunderstorms and showers are likely, certainly western Nevada, which has seen quite a bit of rainfall lately. I think that will continue. Some of these showers and storms likely to sneak into parts of the Snake River Valley or the Treasure Valley. Again, not as widespread at those lower elevations, uh, but sometimes as these showers and storms develop in the upper elevations, they can then uh, get kind of blown off into the, some of these arable areas, returning precip there. But certainly the watershed continuing to get precipitation here through parts of June. Whether we get this all the way up into eastern Washington, I think is uh, yet to be seen, although signal there increasing as we move uh, through June. We talked about kind of the June forecast, whether this area would get some of this increased rainfall. I think that's uh, starting to show up in some of these long-term forecasts. We'll talk about that uh, in just a bit here. Not a huge signal across the Central Valley uh, for widespread rainfall, but again, wouldn't rule out a shower or storm lingering through here on Sunday or Monday. If we want to go beyond that, we kind of took that forecast out through 10 days, maybe seven to 10 days. If we look at the jet stream, kind of valid here as of mid next week. We talked about kind of that almost blocked uh, like signature in the jet stream here where we have this kind of fold of higher pressure or upper level heights moving into the Pacific Northwest. That's an upper level ridging kind of folding back into a trough here off the coast of California. Something that looks a little bit like that won't change the pattern around too much. But if you look carefully now, this is getting further out into the forecast. If I play this jet stream forecast from the ECMWF ensemble out to let's say Saturday, June 17th, we have replaced in the Northeast Pacific what was some troughing here and some ridging over the Pacific Northwest, which a much larger long wave ridge now in the Eastern Pacific, and that's helping to bring some troughing back into the Pacific Northwest. And we actually see kind of this long wave pattern. We have ridging over the Northeast Pacific, and kind of long wave troughing over really the whole of the Western region of the United States. And we're kind of even keeping a subtropical component coming out of the 
more southern Pacific near the equator, associated again with that developing El Nino we're thinking. If we do see this pattern flip all the way into next weekend, kind of would be this pattern. I don't know if I'd call it a flip because it's not a huge swing in terms of temperatures or precipitation, but it would likely bring more seasonal temperatures into the Pacific Northwest. We would be less talking about kind of a tail of two halves of the West, and we'd be talking about, uh, you know, a tail of one uh, in the West, if you will, uh, where we're just kind of bringing temperatures down across the board in the Western region. Now, not any sort of extreme that we're expecting at this time, not seeing that in a signal we're talking about some kind of ridiculous frost here in mid-June, uh, but temperatures finally maybe a break in the warmer weather in parts of the Pacific Northwest, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. If we try to sum this up, looking at the Climate Prediction Center, their forecast for next week, we see that colder weather to the south. We kind of saw this pattern already when we looked at those 10-day temperature anomalies. A bit warmer, kind of trending more seasonal as we go from June 13th to the 17th, kind of the end of next week. Trending more seasonal in the Pacific Northwest, perhaps the Willamette Valley. If we look at precipitation anomalies over that same time period, we keep that bullseye over the interior. That kind of same pattern we've been seeing with that subtropical jet stream coming up out of the Pacific, helping to run over the interior west, which is warming up at this time, just kind of climatologically. And that kind of imbalance is helping to fuel some of these thunderstorms and showers over the interior of the west. Some of those kind of bleeding into parts of California, the Sierra Nevadas, perhaps even the Central Valley, as I talked about, but not a huge signal there. And we're kind of keeping some lingering signal of perhaps some increased precipitation over eastern Washington or maybe even into the Treasure Valley, not as bona fide as a signal there yet. Now, if I take this out to the 8 to 14 day outlook, now we're getting into not what I'd call a pattern flip, but maybe a more wholesale cool down across the western region where we're not talking about heat waves in kind of the SeaTac or Willamette Valley area uh, and really kind of seeing temperatures either become seasonal or colder across the board for much, if not the entire western region. But not a huge change right in that precipitation pattern if you look at the map on the right, keeping that bullseye really kind of over eastern Nevada and western Utah with decreasing values still elevated, kind of expanding out from there. Now, just for fun, I'm taking you all the way back to the Western Pacific. Uh, this is not late May now. This is a live uh, infrared satellite uh, picture, June 7th here, Wednesday uh, afternoon, of a tropical storm not kind of strengthening to the equivalent of a hurricane status yet. Uh, I'm going to probably not do a great job of pronouncing this, but this is tropical storm uh, Guchal over in the Western Pacific, kind of rather close to where Super Typhoon Malar developed. Now, I'm showing this just for fun because we're not expecting uh, the same sort of development or strengthening out of this storm that we saw with Super Typhoon Mawar. Uh, it is expected to strengthen perhaps toward a hurricane strength. I'll pull up the forecast here from the GFS. You can see Tropical Storm uh, Guchal here uh, just south of Japan. Expected to strengthen a bit down to 975 millibars, uh, but not nearly uh, down to the 897 millibars uh, that Super Typhoon Mawar reached. And it too is expected to recurve up into the North Pacific. Perhaps we'll have some reflection or influence on that uh, Pacific jet stream there, but given it's significantly weaker, uh, not expecting kind of a huge pattern shift out of something like this. Uh, just kind of fun to follow these storms and these events, sort of the butterfly effect nature of the weather and the atmosphere. Uh, you know, we talked about things like the East Australian current, we talked about fishing off the coast of Peru, uh, super typhoons on the far west Pacific. You know, all these things are somewhat connected. Uh, and part of our job, either in agriculture or meteorology, is figuring out which of these is going to impact our weather or our operation. And kind of juggling these things is difficult. It's a challenge, but it's also what makes it exciting. And it keeps us kind of learning as we go throughout all of this. I want to give you kind of a closer look at the precipitation picture, more of kind of a fine-tuned forecast here over the next seven days. I'll go through this quickly because I don't want to have this video too on too far too long here. But as I take this through Wednesday night, we see kind of those afternoon storms here on Wednesday afternoon over the interior. So take this through Thursday evening, see kind of similar reflection of that. We continue with the storminess along the leeward side of the Sierra Nevadas. Storms linger in the interior west, uh, again, perhaps getting into the Snake River Valley here on Thursday evening. If I play this through Friday, similar story through Friday, uh, right? Kind of been a similar story we've talked about uh, for the last three to four weeks in terms of interior shower and storm chances in the afternoon. It's really when we get into Saturday evening into Sunday that we see a slight change. We see a bigger uptick in precipitation over California as this upper level low sneaks into the area. And you can actually see a reflection of this upper level low in some of these contours here. There's actually an atmospheric thickness uh, oval here signaling kind of that upper level low sneaking into the area. And if you actually look closely at the precipitation on Saturday, you can see some kind of precipitation streaks sneaking around associated with that cutoff low, which by Sunday evening is parked kind of right over California, which is why we talked about the shower and storm chances in the Central Valley likely kind of peaking Sunday or Monday 
as a result of some of this upper level low, these cool uh, temperatures aloft in the atmosphere, helping to fuel some of the instability, uh, which could allow a thunderstorm or a shower to spark off uh, either through the North Valley or through the San Joaquin Valley. And even if I take it this through uh, Monday evening, kind of a similar pattern here, quite a bit of precipitation in western Nevada, coastal mountains of California toward the north, uh, eastern kind of Sierra of Nevadas, uh, but again, kind of lingering precipitation chances across the Central Valley, maybe something like a 20% to 30% chance of rainfall, depending on where exactly you are in the valley. By Tuesday and Wednesday, we noticed on the jet stream map that that upper level low was kind of ejecting toward the west, kind of out of the kind of California region uh, by Wednesday and Thursday, and that kind of quiets things down across much of the western region, not even seeing kind of that same pronounced uh, interior west precipitation chance, but nonetheless expecting that to return to some point here as we get into next weekend, not this weekend, but next weekend and beyond, uh, potentially uh, getting that pattern shift where we bring some cooler temperatures into Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Now, if we look out even further, this is looking at the ECMWF weekly forecast from June 10th all the way up to July 10th, we'll call it kind of the monthly forecast here. Not seeing a big shift here from the ECMWF long range models. We still see this kind of cooler pattern across California, Nevada, Arizona. I think again, we're seeing the reflection of these sea surface temperatures I was showing you earlier. We have colder than average temperatures toward the southwest of California, helping to keep this area cooler, kind of a southern western region of the United States. We have some warmer temperatures off the uh, in the northeast Pacific here, excuse me, helping to kind of push uh, some of this upper level ridging into this area, which is keeping parts of Washington, the Pacific Northwest warmer and drier. So not a surprise to see the kind of weekly or the monthly forecast shift back toward that same pattern that we've been seeing. It's not really clear at this point what's going to shake us out of that pattern long term. If we look at that same forecast, kind of that 30 day forecast, June 10th through July 10th, uh, precipitation wise, probably looks pretty familiar. We just talked about how the Pacific Northwest as a result of those ocean temperatures likely remaining drier through the period here, but still seeing that interior west precipitation chances, parts of Nevada, eastern Oregon, parts of southern Idaho, northern California, and the crest and toward the east of the Sierra Nevadas. If we look at the new ECMWF seasonal outlook, this is June, July, August, looking at precipitation anomalies. Frankly, looks somewhat similar to even that monthly precipitation forecast we were just looking at. In fact, if I kind of flip back through these quickly, not quite as pronounced, but June, July, August, expecting this area to remain active as a result of that subtropical jet stream kind of pushing into the area here. And another kind of symptom of that subtropical jet stream that we've talked about is it will disrupt this monsoonal circulation that typically develops in late summer here in the desert southwest. And the disruption of that cyclone will prevent some of this low-level tropical moisture from pushing into the area from the eastern Pacific and far western Atlantic and could weaken or delay the start of our desert southwest monsoon season in Arizona, Nevada, perhaps decreasing thunderstorm chances for the lower Colorado River Valley, which we typically contend with in late summer and early fall. That's kind of been a consistent feature of this forecast. Another feature has been this kind of drier signal across the Pacific Northwest. If we look at temperatures over that same time period, as a result of that kind of decreased monsoon season, expecting perhaps some warmer temperatures here just as a result of decreased cloudiness and rainfall, keeping kind of that seasonal or cooler temperature outlook going for June, July, August from California, Nevada, Utah, parts of Western Arizona, perhaps. Again, kind of not expecting, uh, you know, huge heat risk or excessive heat warning risk here in parts of the Central Valley or even the lower Colorado River, excuse me, the lower <laughs> Colorado River Valley in Western Arizona, far Southern or Southeastern California, where we are expecting heat risk again as those waters are warming in the Northeast Pacific. And these high pressure systems have been kind of consistently building into parts of Canada, British Columbia, sneaking into parts of Washington and Idaho. Heat risk existing here in the Pacific Northwest. And if we continue to dry out this area, those two features uh, can kind of produce a vicious cycle where you continue to get drier, you continue to get warmer, uh, and vice versa. Fortunately, right now, not seeing you know widespread drought risks at the moment. But if we kind of continue that drier weather and that warmer weather pattern through an entire summer, unfortunately, I expect this map to get a little more colorful uh, as a result of that. Can't say anything too definitive as of yet. We've kind of avoided any sort of major heat waves, uh, but perhaps starting to think about something like drought or wildfires toward the end of summer. But again, can't be too definitive, quite a ways out uh, from that, but wanted to sound kind of a signal here that that's something we're keeping an eye on. I'll kind of finish up here on a different note uh, this morning. Uh, June 7th, early in the morning, uh, Kilauea on the big island of Hawaii erupted uh, for actually for the first time uh, in a few years. Uh, typically a very active 
uh, volcano on the Big Island here. This is a live uh, webcam shot of the Kilauea Crater here, and you can see uh, not a ton of activity here in the afternoon, uh, but certainly this morning, uh, quite a big bit of lava activity. In fact, if I jump over to the USGS uh, Twitter account here, a very cool video uh, from USGS Volcanoes. Recommend following them if you want to look at cool volcano videos. This is from earlier this morning, a lot of lava flowing out of that Kilauea crater. If you remember at the end of last year, we talked about a Mauna Loa, which had erupted on the Big Island. Mauna Loa being the huge shield volcano that kind of towers over the Big Island of Hawaii. It had not erupted uh, since 1984. But this one erupting here, kind of on the eastern side of the island, uh, more recently in 2021 and now in 2023. If I jump over and we look at uh, the National Weather Service out of Honolulu, they had a very neat tweet today showing infrared imagery uh, from the big island of Hawaii. If you see, it's kind of colder, bluer colors here. There's Mauna Loa, that very tall uh, volcano, that shield volcano in the middle of the big island of Hawaii. Colder temperatures as you go up uh, the side of that mountain here toward the summit there at the top. That's why it's getting dark colored, these kind of bluer colors. But if you go over to the east here toward Kilauea, uh, there is the overnight erupting volcano showing very uh, hot temperatures on the infrared satellite here. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. This hot lava here would certainly show up as a big hot spot on the infrared imagery from the satellite, but just cool that we can see this all the way from space. We've kind of covered every base here across the Pacific Ocean in terms of inclement weather. Another important point about Hawaii here, kind of connecting it to El Nino, uh, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, has released uh, their forecast for the Central Pacific hurricane season, and they are predicting an above average season for the Central Pacific, in which contained is the state and the islands of Hawaii. Now, we can't predict with much certainty whether uh, any of these storms will make landfall in Hawaii. If you think about how big the Pacific is, even the Central Pacific, and how small the islands of Hawaii are, at least relative to that, it's hard to give any sort of definitive forecast in terms of landfalling systems. But we do know that more systems, at least statistically, increases the chances of a landfall. And they're predicting an above average season for the Central Tropical Pacific in terms of hurricanes, just as a result of El Nino. Warmer temperatures in the Central Tropical Pacific, hurricanes, they're fueled by those warmer ocean temperatures, all else equal. And that's a possibility, something we'll be keeping an eye on as that Pacific hurricane season ramps up here in late summer and early fall. That is all I have for you all this evening. Thank you for watching.